It's an interesting topic there, Gabby. Pick, up, pick five things that are really important in selecting, selecting patients for TAVI. So it got me thinking. Um, transcatheter valve replacement really is now a standard of care. There's been a lot of rapid innovation over the 10 years that we've introduced it. And this is just one of the devices, one of the more popular devices. And it's really changed a lot in 10 years. We've gone from very clunky devices that are large in profile, difficult to use, less reliable results to things that are very slick now. They have a low profile, they're easily delivered. They can be recaptured if they're not in the right position. They have adaptive wraps and seals to prevent paravalval leak. And there's wider size ranges so that we can treat a greater range of patients and they're fairly simple to deliver and deploy. So it's come a long way. And there's been a strong evidence base that's built through this with multiple randomised controlled trials against a gold standard. And if you believe meta-analyses, you, you might even consider that perhaps in high and intermediate risk patients, putting all this together, that these patients might do better, the older patients with higher risk and intermediate risk, with TAVI over surgical aortic valve replacement. And there's really excellent local experience now. I mean. Um, centres in Australia have developed from 10 years ago to be really expert at this and um, a number of centres have led the way in new innovations in uh, future technologies. And it's really set to supplant surgery into the future as a standard of care in older patients. You can see globally there's been massive uptake of this technology, 200,000 to 300,000 now implants <coughs> per year off the back of that evidence and if you look at centres such as the US and Germany to give a view into the future of where we might be going, you can see that TAVI really has taken off. And in places like Germany, which were probably a bit extreme, it's sort of become the dominant technology for the treatment of aortic stenosis. For us in 2018, certainly intermediate and high-risk patients, TAVI is a, is a good option and it's green-lighted. There's that larger group, though, the low-risk the low patients in whom surgery has been the the standard of care, but that's been challenged. Um, there are now studies to look at TAVI in low risk. <coughs> Partner trials should start to deliver some results soon. And the studies that we do have, on randomised studies, really do suggest that you're probably going to get some good results even in low risk patient groups for TAVI compared to open surgery. Now we've heard it's approved in Australia. That's only recent. We have operator and institutional requirements give us some indication of what we expect from the hospital and the people doing it. And from November, only November last year, it's been approved in high-risk patients, those who are high-risk for surgical aortic valve replacement or considered inoperable. And they want the right person in the right place and the right patient, but who's the right patient? That's the question. What do our guidelines say about selecting patients? Well, our guidelines don't say much. We don't actually have any guidelines in Australia to guide us on what we should be, who we should be selecting. I think probably the best guidelines or the most transferable to us would be the Europeans. And they've got some very good guidelines recently published to give us some indication about who we should be taking to TAVI. But if you're the standard sort of person, the referrer, the maybe you're not intimately involved in understanding the nuances of these guidelines. The question is really, what do they mean? And who, who do you really select? They're fairly carefully, carefully crafted words. So what important, what five questions should you really ask yourself if you're going to select someone for Tavian? Thinking about this, these are the ones that I came up with. You can tell me if you find them useful. So the first thing is, is this patient likely to get at least two years of reasonable quality life if their aortic stenosis is revealed, is relieved. And that's an important question. Futility, from a sort of health economics and other point of view, is the patient doesn't survive to a year, but is, is really one year a great result? I think we've always thought you should be able to get several years of useful life if you treat this patient. And that's why we have multidisciplinary heart teams evaluating these patients. We have comprehensive evaluations of the patient's comorbidities that go into the discussion that is undertaken by the heart team. And very important in that is obviously the geriatrician, the general physician of the elderly, to give you some in insights as to the comorbidities and likely survival of this patient. And it is surprising because people will say, why are you doing this in all these old people? What are you getting out of it? What are they getting out of it? And I think. If you're 85, you can look forward to set all things equal seven years of reasonable life if you, if you don't have any other 
major uh, life-threatening illness at that time. And if you're 90, the actuarial survival, people think, well, 90, gee, are they going to survive much longer? Why are you doing that? Well, it's actually about four to five years. So it's helpful to have a very comprehensive assessment. The second real important question you've got to ask yourself is, is TAVI going to be technically feasible in this patient? And to determine that, we do echoes, we do angiography, and we undertake very important CT analysis of the valve and the annulus. And finally, we have to have a very careful assessment of access, the vascular tree and vascular access. And that's really CT as a backbone of that. And understanding the CT assessment of these patients is, is a critical factor in selection and a successful outcome. So if you've answered that question, I think the next thing you need to say to yourself, well, is there any reason that maybe we don't want to have an operation done on this patient? Are there technical or other cl clinical considerations that make surgery unattractive? And of course it might be that the patient has some kind of hos hostile mediastinum. It might be they've got a porcelain aorta, and of course no surgeon's going to be keen to cross over that. Or it might be that they have a beautiful lemur that's running closely behind their sternum and they have patent grafts and nobody often wants to mess with that situation and endanger effective revascularization. So they might be reasons. And of course, the other reason might be that your polar bear is not really looking too, too good. And this links to the next question, which is about frailty. And that bit is, is the morbidity in this patient as important as mortality? And if, if you're, you're an elderly patient, it might be that just simply surviving an operation is not necessarily the only thing you're concerned about. Maybe spending weeks in hospital or weeks in intensive care and maybe never actually being quite the same again is not a good outcome in that patient group. So we've become very good at assessing frailty. Now, when we first started this, we, all we had was the end of the bed test and if they had a beanie on and the O sign, as we used to say, then that was <laughs> not good and uh, we tended to move on. But we've actually become a lot more sophisticated about how we quantitatively evaluate these patients and assess them in an objective way. And I think uh, the TAVI team gets very good at understanding what they mean by gait speed and grip strength and CATS index. <laughs> and their cognitive evaluation. So that, those are the really, that, the frailty becomes an important question. Um, and finally, this other question that always comes up is, will valve durability be an issue for this patient? Now, a few years ago, they looked at some outcomes in TAVI because we haven't had TAVI for that long. We don't know the 20-year outcomes yet. We're barely scraping off at the 10-year outcomes. And uh, the question is, well, how are these patients gonna do? Uh, do, if it's a young patient, say 70, the considerations are very different than if the patient, say, 88 or 85. I guess what's reassuring is that some of the more recent data suggests that probably the TAVI, like surgical bias prosthetic valves, does fairly similar. Uh, they probably have a fairly similar durability. And in fact, the, TAV, the TAVI valve may, in fact, do a bit better because the effective orifice areas are larger. But we don't know yet, and there are going to be studies that are going to give us the real answer to the durability question. But certainly from a bioprosthetic valve, 10 years, if you're getting more than that, you've done pretty well. So you need to ask that question, is durability going to be a problem in this patient? If you go back to those 2017 guidelines with all of the complex wording and screed of text, they do provide an attempt to sort of illustrate some of these points in a table, and they've broken it up differently to the way I've thought about it, but they've looked at clinical characteristics that might favour TAVI and those that might favour surgery. So very low risk, surgery still has the evidence base. If they're higher risk, it favours TAVI. If they have severe comorbidities, it favours TAVI. Uh, if the patient's older, it's, it's probably better to consider TAVI. Durability and all these other things become less of a concern. Younger patients favour surgery. If they've had previous operations, if they're frail, restricted mobility or in an uncommon situation you're worried about infection, that may all influence what you think about which therapy is best. Obviously there are anatomical and technical aspects. If, if, if you can do it transfemily, the results are good. Alternative access have struggled to demonstrate the same results of, as transfemoral. 
Uh, if there are problems that really prevent surgery, as we've discussed, like a hostile mediastinum or porcelain aorta, they've indicated that favours TAVI. Um, if there are low coronary heights, if the annulus is way out of range for a TAVI valve, if the morphology is unfavourable, if there's bicuspid valves or thrombus, then that might favour surgery. So, um, and of course, if there's another reason for the patient to have surgical um, therapy, such as other concomitant valve disease or an aneurysm or severe coronary disease that needs bypass, then that, that's obviously going to favour surgical AVR. So to bring it back to the question, what are the five important things that you should ask yourself? I think these things probably cover most bases. Ask yourself, is the patient likely to get useful, uh, useful quality of life over the next few years if we treat them? Is TAVI technically feasible? Are there technical or clinical considerations that make surgery unattractive? And is morbidity going to be important in that patient group? Are they frail because uh, a less invasive uh, therapy is going to be preferred? And then is valve durability an issue? 60-year-old, 65-year-old male is going to be an issue. 85-year-old uh, patient, maybe less so. So, we'll, uh, And that's our first patient that we selected nearly 10 years ago, and uh, he survived for six years post-implant. So it can be a very good therapy uh, for a patient cohort. Thank you.